Welcome back, everybody, to In The Loop. Hey, this is Evelyn from The Smithy Group. Have you ever been interested in buying a car, changed your mind, and then could not escape that you were interested in buying that car? Or have you ever gotten an email or a text from a brand and you forgot that you gave them permission to do that when you checked out? These are the questions we're answering in the digital salesperson, how to integrate digital into your clientele process effectively. I'm joined by Cody Giles, The Smithy Group, and we're breaking it down for you in this two-part episode, and this is part two. This episode is brought to you by Punchmark, the jewelry industry's leading website provider. Join the community of nearly 500 other jewelry stores in choosing Punchmark's easy-to-run and e-commerce-enabled website platform by visiting punchmark.com for your free trial demo. This episode is also brought to you by The Smithy Group, a digital growth agency that helps leaders and businesses dream bigger and achieve multi-generational integrity. Through insights and intelligence, digital marketing, and advertising solutions, we help businesses expand their business and grow their revenue. We have helped hundreds of businesses surpass their goals and believe that whatever your business, whatever your story, we will make it matter to your audience. And a very special thank you to The Edge for sponsoring this week's episode. We'll hear more about them later on in the show. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to In The Loop. We're excited to have you here. My name is Evelyn Stetzer. I'm the integrated strategist at the Smithy Group. And we've got another TSG takeover for today's podcast with the second part of an important two-part conversation on the digital salesperson, integrating digital service into your clientele process for the ultimate customer experience. I'm joined today by Cody Giles, our director of integrated strategy, and we're diving into part two. What's up, Cody? Hey, how you doing? Excited for part two. I'm good. Let's get into it. So, On the last episode, we talked heavily about email automations and website integrations and one more Asian uh, in-store operations to make sure your digital process is working for you. We talked about the difference between the digital salesperson, meaning digital helping the salesperson or literally acting as like a bot, like a salesperson that you can control and work toward for you. So today we're going to keep breaking down this concept of the digital salesperson and how it all comes together. And we left off somewhere that both you and I love to talk about. And Cody, I think you're the perfect person to talk about this. Birthdays and anniversaries. Talk to us about everything you have to say on this. So we left off on a cliffhanger for the last episode about birthdays and anniversaries. What we were talking about was somebody coming into your store. This is a plus for in-store online, right? But somebody coming into your store, they're looking at pieces. And the question is, are you putting those pieces on their wish list? And if you are, are you also kind of browsing for additional information from them? So, hey, when's your birthday coming up? Or do you have an anniversary coming up? And, you know, we're doing this for wish list, but any customer overall, like, are you getting this extra information from them uh, with these important dates in their life? And why do you do this is because we can actually use this for marketing and what we can do in the future for clientele. So um, talked with Evelyn as we were prepping for the episode just about birthdays and what brands do for somebody's birthdays, like how they make them feel special. And like we both know that you know when our birthdays are coming up or we're checking our emails, waiting to see if we're getting uh, a special offer from a brand that we follow. So maybe it's a, a free treat if it's a restaurant or it's a discount if it's a brand that we love. Evelyn, I think, signed up wrong for one of uh, the brands she follows. <laughs> I did. I was just laughing about it because I made my birthday a month late on accident on a site. I think it was a typo, but it was the perfect surprise and delight. When I got that email, I was like, thanks last year, me. I have such, I have another gift I can, I can redeem that I wasn't expecting. I think that's so true of birthdays and anniversaries that it is something really nice to receive from a brand. It's not something that every brand does, but it's such an easy way to win, I feel, just to capture that information and be consistent about it. Um, we can talk through now timing. I know we talked a lot about timing for pop-ups and timing for automations for email campaigns. So just like this, the timing is everything. So I know a few brands that think about this two weeks in advance. You know, We want to be early. We want to be the first to wish you a happy birthday. Here's your discount code that you can redeem in the next 30 days. So it has a little bit of pressure to it. I find that works really well for a few of the brands we work with. Yeah, I kind of when it's coming early, it reminds you that your birthday is coming, so you kind of get excited. So we're talking about all this just to say, think about the information you collect. Do you have an opportunity, if you're not already doing this, to really surprise and delight your customers and people that follow you because you have their email address, you have their information, and you're giving them some sort of uh, incentive whenever their birthday is coming or whenever their anniversary is coming. And this all goes back to those are such special occasions for them 
And if you can kind of mm-hmm. bring your brand into that and integrate your own brand into that special moment, it's going to make it seem even better, right? So it's all for us. It's really about how do we bring the brand into those special moments that uh, the customers are celebrating? How do we kind of get incorporated into that? So ways that we do that is via email automation. So if let's say you do have, you know, when a customer's birthday is and you have an email automation, or you have an email platform like MailChimp, Constant Contact, most of them do this, right? You can set up an automation so 20 days before somebody's birthday or two weeks before somebody's birthday, you can send them an email that says, hey, hello, insert first name. Your birthday's coming up and we wanna make you feel special. Bring in this email or show us this email and receive 10% off your next purchase, for example. So we've seen direct conversion from that, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to think about what you'd wanna offer. So do you wanna do a a certain amount off? Do you wanna do a percentage off? Do you wanna give just, if you're in the jewelry industry, which most of our listeners are, do you wanna give, you know, a small free jewelry cleaning kit, for example. Um, thinking about the offers, and we've had clients that have thought about that based on how much customers have spent with them. So we've ran series where we have automations going out for the top customers, and you're giving them something extra, extra special, and then like a second tier level of just a normal customer base, and you're giving them something different there. So it makes the top tier feel even more special through that. So think about that. You know, if you're not emailing, you want something that's a bit different, mass texting, you can also use that. So if you're using a CRM platform that allows you to do mass text, you can do the same process. So two weeks before someone's birthday, we have a text message go out that has a fun image of like a GIF for birthdays, right? And a, just a brief description, your birthday's coming up, we wanna celebrate, click on the link below to redeem your offer, for example. So the, it works the same way with anniversaries, the same way we're talking about birthdays. So those two options are great opportunities to, again, surprise and delight your customers and have them feel extra special on their big moments. That's a lot, I love it. Cody, you were the right person to bring in to talk about birthdays and anniversaries. I love birthdays. Love them. Um, I, I want to pull out a few things you said in there. So you talked about how it can be a surprise and delight in, in making your brand part of their birthday experience. I want to encourage brands who are listening to this in the jewelry industry to also think about partnerships and think big and think about, you know, can we partner with a local bakery to make something special for their birthday and just put a card that's branded in it? So it doesn't feel necessarily like it's coming from a jewelry store. There's no pressure to purchase. It's just a gift to get them thinking about you. So I want to think about that too, just how can people integrate that experience, that text or that like come in, redeem this, this offer type with digital. So I just find that an interesting angle as well to take. It's really good. So talking about mass texting and emailing, it's kind of hard to, to distinguish the relationship between them, how they work. And I want to just have a more nuanced discussion about how can we utilize mass texts, but then how does email complement this or act differently? Because I bet a lot of people are asking that. So we're setting these things up for birthdays. We're setting these things up for anniversaries. What makes them different, like core characteristics of both that feel genuine? Yeah, I think, you know, for a long time, people always loved email marketing because it was a direct one-to-one communication with somebody compared to socialized traditional ads, X, Y, Z. Texting goes just a bit beyond that, right? We're more apt to, we get a text directly on our phone. That's that instant notification for my emails. I don't get every single email alert that's coming into my inbox. I have to go so often into my mail app or check my mail to receive that. So the texting element does have that a slight edge in that it's going directly to a person, they're being notified about that, et cetera. But you do have to realize you can't deliver the same type of content on both places. So as we look at it, we think about texting as being more of those conversational elements where email is more of the editorial elements, more about styling, X, Y, Z. Typically with texting, you're gonna have, be able to you know use an image or use a, a GIF, something that doesn't have, with text messages, you can't send a lot of stuff, right? It's, for the file size is somewhat limited, so image or a GIF, and then just a bit of text there along with the link, right? Whereas emails, you can make really long content, people can scroll through and have a lot of clickability. Texting, you're really limited to just a few things that people can click. So just thinking about what your overall goal is. So when we talk about birthday and anniversary as an example, you can really do either one of those because either approach can be pretty straightforward in what you're doing, but you look at other elements. So when we talk about you know a new product drop, you could do a quick text about that. Just, and this can go to you know, just your top customers if you wanted. It says, new product just announced, be the first to see it, click here. Like if you have the opportunity to say something very quick, texting could be your option, but if you need to really tell the story, that's where email is gonna be more important. I think it gets a bit tricky when you talk about them complimenting each other because people are gonna be checking things differently throughout the day. So even though you sent them together, like let's say you're like, oh, I wanna do a text and an email at the same time. Well, people aren't gonna view it at the same time most likely. So you have to think that through and know that everything works together, right, in the grand scheme. But I think one-to-one, they don't necessarily always complement each other. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just thinking about that with a brand that 
contacts me via email and via text and how you know, I can tell from their, their marketing efforts and ads as well that they're trying to promote this new line, right? This new line of jewelry. It's their summer edit, whatever you want to call it. And it's, it's clever how they use the mediums of ads and then text and then email separately to get the same message across, but meet me where I'm at in each of those channels. Um, so that's why I love this question, because it's like, how can you distill it in a different way to meet what it is that you're trying to say in that channel? So talking through the email, like they'll show the entire collection, they'll style it, they'll show it on people, they'll show some user-generated content, and that is beautiful. Like it's storytelling, it's a bit more editorial in style. And then for text, they sent me the collection on a pug, like a pug dog, and said, the summer drop is here, like, something something the pug I forget the name of the pug has has it do you have it and very different approach but very effective marketing nonetheless <laughs> you're right you're not mad to get pictures of cute puppies via text we're not mad at all yeah and that is what I think about with a digital salesperson you know you set up those mass texts and you're thinking about everyone that's reading it what will be the most well received and then how can you also think about email as a separate but complementary channel to that to build on the messaging in a different way. So it all works together is what we're trying to go for here. Yeah, I want to make sure I clarify that it all works together. I think I might have said that, you know, they don't necessarily one to one complement each other, mm -hmm. but they, in the grand scheme of things, everything works together. So just think through, you know, how you're using each of those independently. But again, they'll all come together in the end. And if, you know, cute dog picks works for you, it's a chance to sort of break away and have something memorable, that's even great too. The last piece I'll say, you also have to think about frequency when it comes to texting, even compared to emails. You can say, hey, we send out emails twice a week and that works for us, great. You might not see that same success whenever you're doing text messaging. I know there's several brands that text me and I get sometimes a couple texts a day or a couple a week. And because I'm, those text messages are embedded within all of my personal conversations, I don't know, I feel a bit more that I'm, I'm watching out for those. I notice them more, which is a good thing, but I also then notice the frequency as well. So sometimes I'm even turned off by, like, oh, they sent me a lot of text messages this past week compared to what I feel like they should be doing. So I think you might have a bit more runway in terms of frequency via email compared to text messaging, just because you're going into that personal environment of conversations they're having compared to email, which feels a bit more separated from them. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really important point to think about when it comes to frequency and the trust. Right. You, you said earlier that the email inbox used to be where you saw every notification as it came in and you paid attention to it. And now the text inbox is a bit more precious, right? Than the email inbox is the email is now saturated, right. which is so interesting how things have shifted. I mean, let's go back to the, I mean, this is against the digital salesperson idea, but like go back to, you know, in-person mail that you get in your mailbox. Mailers, postcards. When will we go back to mailers? Hey, they have their own place, but different conversation for a different day. Um, but anyhow, just thinking about how precious the text is in today's marketing and how how to utilize that as a business. So think about the digital salesperson. What kind of personality do they have? How often do they want to reach out? If you were to put like a, a persona on this idea of the digital salesperson, ask yourself frequency questions and what would make you feel most valued if you were having a conversation with this digital salesperson. That's good. All right, let's pause for a quick word from our sponsors and then we'll be back. Support for this week's episode comes from The Edge. The Edge is the jewelry industry's leading point of sale system, though you've probably already heard about how amazing they are. They're in the business to help independent jewelers succeed in an ever-evolving retail environment where technology plays a major role. Their promise to their clients is to never let them get caught in technological or functional time warp. The Edge develops their software on state-of-the-art technology and adds features and functionality in the best interest of their users. In the words of Edge founder Dick Abbott, our biggest reward is the success of our store owners. To learn more about the Edge Point of Sale system and all the ways that can accelerate your business approach into an omni-channel solution, visit theedgeforjewelers.com. Thanks, back to the show. Alrighty, and we're back. So let's close this conversation on the digital salesperson. We've talked a lot about emails, website integrations, in-person things, birthdays and anniversaries, our favorites. And now I would love to have an open conversation about how this all comes together 
effectively. We've already hinted at a few of our own personal experiences with different brands or what we coach our clients on. There's a lot here. And sometimes it's like, okay, I hear you, but how do I actually implement this when it comes to my store or a campaign that we have coming up? So now Cody and I are just going to take turns going through a few different industries that we've seen or examples we've seen and break it down very clearly so we can show effective digital salespersoning. <laughs> <laughs> digital salespersoning. When Evelyn mentioned it, this, when we were talking about this towards the end, I was starting to think about, as we think about you know digital clientele and experiences as I'm a customer that's at the top of the funnel and how a brand can pull me through that funnel. What I come back to is experiences that you have with car dealerships in the automotive industry. So I'm in the process right now of purchasing a vehicle and starting to look at a few different, you know, websites, dealerships, putting in information to get the price. So we know they always don't show that full price sometimes due to put in information to get more details. So it's just like, once you put in that information and some people really don't like this, (laughs) once they have your information, they're doing everything they can to convert you into a customer. And for a lot of people, this feels overwhelming. For me as a marketer, I was just watching for what are all these touch points are coming at me with to convert me as a customer. So we're looking at, we're buying a car for my sister. So we're looking at Toyota. So went to the Toyota dealership. It's close to me, looked at different vehicles, inquired about one. As soon as I inquired, I get an automated email to start. Thank you so much for your inquiry. Somebody will be responding to you within one business day. This was after hours, right? So I got the message about them being after hours all this information, perfect. But that hit my inbox instantly after I put in the information. Well, then the next day, that's when it really started to come in. So (laughs) the first thing I got was another email from somebody in store said, hey, we got your information request. Could you provide us with more details? Like let us know what you're looking for, how we can assist you. Kind of talk to them about the vehicle. Then I get a video from them about, like it's it's a personal tour of the car that I'm looking at that I've seen online. And it's them saying- They texted it to you? There was an email. And in the same process, they're also saying, hey, can, would text also be a way that we could communicate with you? So this is happening simultaneously. So I get the video, right? Click play. And it's, it's an actual personalized video. It's like, hey, Cody, thanks so much for reaching out about this Toyota RAV4. We just wanted to kind of show you around the vehicle. It's on the lot if you want to come take a look. And then they spent about two to three minutes walking around the car and just showing me different aspects of the vehicle. So they email that through and then they ask if you can text. If, so I give them my information to text. And sometimes I would even, from other dealerships, also get a message from them via text, but I have to confirm first, right? Because I've just provided them my information. Then I get the text message to say, hey, this is so-and-so from Toyota. Can we please opt into text messages? X, Y, Z, X, some verbiage there. I say, yes, you can respond to me via text and then we'll start talking via text. But it's all kind of happening at the same time. So I'm getting the emails coming in with a personalized video. I have the text coming in to make sure they can text me. Wow. And then from there, it's just a lot of back and forth. And then outside of those interactions that I'm having with them, I'm also part of the regular drip funnel, so I'm getting a couple emails a week about the dealership in particular, and hey, we're so excited to offer this at, to our customers, this sort of lifetime warranty, X, Y, Z about our services, and I get a few of those, and then I've recently, it's been about two and a half, three weeks, so I know I'm towards the end of their funnel because now the verbiage is shifting to, are you still interested? So it's mm. it's still directed to like everybody that would have you know been in their funnel, so it's, it's still somewhat personalized, but I know it's going out to more people, but they've also clearly defined an endpoint, so they don't just keep hammering people down over and over and over. So it seems like that three week time, the the dealership I'm participating with, they're starting to ramp down the emails. So I'm not, like if I haven't decided that I wanna go with them and start looking somewhere else, I don't keep getting bombarded with emails or text messages about their dealership when I've moved on. So they've recognized that and they've crafted out over three weeks. Outside of the normal one-to-one communication that I have with a salesperson, what are they telling me more about the brand? So it's exactly what we've talked about today of those drip campaigns. It's They've set that up one time and now it's just working for them for a lot of people I'm sure that are inquiring, but it just gives me gradual exposure. And I, you know they know in the automotive industry, you're thinking about that decision for a bit, you're comparing offers, you're looking at many different dealerships. So they've crafted out their funnel and the email automations to take that into consideration because they're talking to me about what they can do and how they stand out all to kind of drop me back into them to make a purchase at that particular dealership. So the automotive industry, we've all dealt with buying cars in the past. So you just know, like once you put in your information, they're calling you, they're doing X, Y, Z. What's interesting that I didn't get many calls is I did get emails and text messages. So I was grateful for that. In the last episode we talked about, we don't like to talk on phone calls. So that was good to be able to get text messages and emails and not be bombarded with phone calls all the time. So just an interesting scenario of clienteling the digital salesperson. 
it's always been hot, I think, in the automotive industry because they're always looking for that sale. That's such a good example. I'm like, <laughs> I'm wild right now, mainly because I love that even to the point we just made about the digital salesperson thinking about frequency and thinking about how they can be respectful of their customer, even in that process of doing things automatically. That's just a really thorough, <laughs> clear experience that you had where it was clear that you were in the funnel in a deeper spot based on your actions that you made. Like there's nothing worse than you just made a purchase and then you're targeted for an ad for what you just bought. That part from as from a marketer, especially for Facebook and Instagram, if we're setting up campaigns and we're working with e-commerce brands, we always make it a point to exclude people that have recently purchased because I hate nothing more than being targeted for an ad and I convert from the ad and I make a purchase and I still continue to get ads like the very next day. Like I made your purchase, like leave me alone now. I've done what you wanted me to do. So good point there. I love that. I love that part of this effectiveness conversation about the digital salesperson has to be, how do you take people out of the funnel? Yeah. You know, after it works. After you've won, what do you do next? Like, that's not to say you take them out of the funnel and they're gone forever. Like, we certainly want to talk about how you keep the customer lifetime value up and what that looks like. But that's a different conversation that we're having now. But thinking that through, it's really, you have to consider that too, of what do you immediately do once a customer converts Yep. Don't keep them in the same funnel. Like pull them out. They don't what you wanted them to do. Don't keep them there. Exactly. That reminds me of this ad I saw on the New York City subway a year ago. I think it was for Bumble, like the dating app. And it's like the app that was invented to be deleted. Yeah. And it took me a minute. I was like, what? You What? And the whole idea is that you find the person you want, so you don't need the app anymore. And I, I wanted to leave that image with people of like the digital salesperson working so well like they, you have this relationship, they purchased that. So you can almost like take them out of that moment and, and put them into a different funnel for a different piece. You know, after someone's bought an engagement ring, just like you said earlier in the last episode, Cody, now they need to be in the funnel for wedding dance and for their next purchase. A lot of our retailers talk about the issue they have with, okay, so a bridal customer, how do I make them another kind of customer? You know, they're young, they're 20 something, they just bought a ring. It's the biggest purchase of their life. They might be 10 years before they make another purchase at the store. And there's a huge drop off that retailers will see. So I think that your your conversation about the automotive industry is very important so people can see, okay, that funnel has closed. Now a new one needs to be set up. They need to be prospected again for a different type of piece or their next purchase that makes sense for them where they're at. Yeah. That I want that's a good point to mention. I want to go back first because you mentioned Bumble and I was trying to think through because I've heard that tagline. I think it's actually hinge that says it's hinged, this. yeah. It's in their tagline like designed to be deleted. And if you just top that in, even on their website, they say eight ways we are designed to be deleted. So they're literally saying, we want you to not use our service anymore, but that means we've done our job and you kind of come out of the funnel. Um, Thanks for the quick Google. Such good, it, it's such good marketing. But the, the piece I want to talk about, it really isn't with engagement rings. So we talk to retailers and we're like, okay, if somebody buys an engagement ring, what are you doing to get them back for their wedding bands? And they're like, well, not much. Like they'll just hopefully come back in later to buy them. And I'm like, you're not doing anything to try to actively close that particular sale. We're just letting them, we're, it's, it's all by chance. You're just hoping they come back. So Evelyn makes a very good point thinking about that. If you're a jeweler, you close that engagement ring sale. What are you doing to follow up on the wedding bands? Because that's a guaranteed purchase they're going to need to make. Why would you even risk them going somewhere else? Mm -hmm. If you have a really good, if you have a high percentage of chance of closing that next sale, what are we doing? So thinking through email automations or clienteling, how do you keep them coming back for neck for that next purchase? And not just saying, well, we think they're going to come back. We're not entirely sure. Yep. It's crazy. Setting up that six month reminder for yourself and for your sales team. Like that's the whole point of this conversation is how do you set up your sales team to win? And something that I love about this conversation, and it really is about empowering the sales team to win and to feel confident and to feel like they have every tool in their toolbox to bring people back, to build relationships with people. We've just seen a transformation for so many of our clients after we've had these conversations, walking through, mapping all of their triggers, all of their processes, who owns what, who sends what and when. There's so much power in that because now it feels like they have a handle on the their services and a handle on their experience and they can almost like rock it more because they don't have to wonder. It's almost that wondering that makes them shaky or makes them ha not sure how to continue the deals with people. I want to go back just one more thing for the engagement rings to wedding band scenario. So if you're thinking about this and you're like, oh, that's a good point. I need to make sure I figure that stuff out. 
you know, when you're, someone's buying an engagement ring, I'm sure you're asking when they're going to get married, right? Mm-hmm. If you know what that date is, that serves two purposes for you. One, it's to make sure you're able to know when they're going to need to close on a wedding ring or when they're going to buy that wedding ring. But then two, if you have that date, start thinking about what you can do for that surprise and delight for their first year anniversary, right? Yep. So what kind of small gift could you get them for their first year anniversary? Just say, hey, we were thinking about you. We know you're celebrating your first year wedding anniversary. Here's a special gift for us. Like, what does that look like? So getting that date, it can serve a few purposes. It lets you know they're going to need to buy a wedding band before this date. And also, mm-hmm. okay, I can use this for a surprise and a lot next year. And it's another one of those like special moments that we talk about, like a, a anniversary. We talked about it, birthday and anniversary. It's a chance to get that information. Oh, I love that. It's all about clienteling. That's really what we're boiling this down to is like digital clienteling and how that integrates. I have one more example before we close because I want to talk to the retailer who might be like, where do we even start? Maybe they don't have all these automations set up. Maybe they don't have a team that can, can work on these right now. I would just say for your next event, how can you involve your website in some way, whether that is in store or pushing all your traffic for ads to a landing page, just start integrating your website in a really real way. I've seen with one of our retailers when they had um, like a summer sale event last year, they just consolidated the way people make appointments by making sure that anybody that called, anybody that emailed, anybody in store, or anybody that came in through uh, online traffic, they all were pushed to one landing page on the site. And this started to teach their customers, oh, they're going digital. Like I can't just email my name in anymore. I have to go through this process and it started teaching their, their customers and their whole community how to, how to treat the brand and how to have a a better, even more seamless experience with the brand. And now they have more opportunities to speak to people through ads and, and do more with that because they've integrated digital. So that's just a really easy first step is just finding a way to utilize your website, talk to Punchmark about landing pages. Hey, Punchmark, you're not on this call right now, but uh, (laughs) on this podcast right now, but giving you a shout out and just utilize landing pages in store and online and see how that sets a first step for you. And that's so good. Like you funnel them there for to sign up. And then you can, since you have their email address because they're signing up, leverage that drip campaign to say, thank you so much for signing up for the event. We can't wait to see you. Here's what you can expect. X, Y, Z, and that gets them excited about the event versus like they've just sent you their information. Now they're waiting for two weeks until the event happens. You get that stuff digitally, then you can start thinking about what you can talk to them about over time to keep them amped up and excited. That way they don't do that two weeks. Let's say they submit their information two weeks down the road, the event happens. They forgot because so much happens in two weeks. They forgot about the event. So think about, let me get their information digitally and let me keep following up with them and talk about how excited we are to see them then they're more likely to actually come into the store because they're getting amped up over time. They're like excited to come in. So something else that you want to think about there. I love that you said uh, a lot can happen in two weeks. That's what 2020 taught us, y'all. That <laughs> True. Anything can happen in two weeks, good and bad. So it's And people are expecting more digital integration. I think that's where I want to land this is just take the leap. Mm-hmm. Expect that people expect this. They expect you to be more digital and integrate it. Um, be clever, be fun, and, and use digital to work for you with building relationships and, and empowering your sales team. Thanks for our conversation today, Cody. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been great. Yep, we'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks. Hey, thanks for listening. Leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. And remember to subscribe. It really helps us grow. Thank you so much. See you next week.